I want to call this meeting of the Belton Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Quorum of board members is present. This meeting has been duly called and posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. If you'll join me in the pledge to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you for joining us. If anybody came in late, you just missed a, quite a treat. Uh, special thanks to Susan D'Amico and our child nutrition department for bringing the food truck for its debut with us this evening and feeding us. Um, we're going to go directly uh, into our, uh, with, uh, we're just going to run directly into our next item, I guess. I'll, okay. I'll wait on other, uh, other recognitions and all. We want to make sure we have time, have uh, all of our students and staff that are being recognized have time to get here. So um, thank you for a little bit of an unusual, for bearing with a little bit of an unusual agenda today, but we weren't sure how long it'd take for all of us to go walk out there and eat and get back but that worked out really well so well. we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a bit but at this point talk to us about uh, districts of innovation okay well um, tonight <laughs> we are asking that you all consider a resolution to initiate the process of exploring the option of a district of designating the Belton. Did you make that vaguer? I know it's yeah. so vague. Um, <laughs> it, uh, an option of designating the Belton Independent School District a district of innovation. And so I'm looking for my <coughs> presentation, Mike or Rachel. Uh oh. They might still be eating there <laughs> at the food truck. Um, you have the presentation in your packet, so I'm I'm going to keep going. Um, <clears throat> so, House Bill 40, uh, 1842, which was introduced by the 84th Legislative Session, um, introduced this concept of District of Innovation, and that it was done to um, provide greater local control to school districts, and so essentially um, what the legislature intended was to give um, school districts some of the same um, opportunities to be exempt from some of the state um, education code that uh, charter schools are exempt from and so we so that we could form committees and make some decisions locally about um, some things that we wanted to do within our district that would be aligned to our vision mission okay So it would allow us to do some things locally that um, would meet our needs and give us some flexibility um, in terms of some of the state requirements that we're under. And so um, some of the things that um, school districts have been exercising so far, there are only about 25 school districts that are districts of innovation so far. Um, and I've been able to read those plans. Um, a lot of those plans focus on um, the school calendar, some attendance requirements, um, but th there are a number of things that you could do um, to be exempt from. And so there's a short list there, um, school start date. This next school year, the school, do school start date is really important to us. It, it, we are mandated um, to start school on the fourth Monday in August this next school year. That falls really late for us and Memorial Day will fall early and so we've already been playing with calendars that Merle has developed and it looks like if we started on that Monday I believe it's August 28th then we would be pushed way into June and so um, a district of innovation is a designation um, if we included in our plan the option of starting earlier then we could bypass that um, require legal requirement to start the fourth Monday in August so that's one thing we could do um, here's some other things class size ratio we currently have um, we have to apply for waivers from the state which we're applying for one tonight to have more than 22 students in a classroom this is not something we probably want to do but it's something we could certainly talk about um, being a district of innovation, if you write that in your plan that you might want to go to 23 or 24 students, then you could do that. 
Um, there's some other options for teacher certifications, for contracts, site-based decision-making, et cetera. <clears throat> so we don't yet know what we would want to do with this plan, but it's something that we certainly would want to explore. And so um, the commissioner has set out some rules for us to uh, follow for this process, and that process has to be initiated um, by this resolution that we're presenting to you tonight or, or a petition um, signed by our DWIC committee. And so we're bringing it to you this evening in the form of a resolution. We would come back next month and bring, um, have a public hearing, and we'd also recommend a committee to study um, all of the ways that we could, we could use this particular designation. Um, moving forward on the slides there, Rachel, if you could. One more. Um, the committee can, could basically include um, any representatives we want from DWIC. It can also now be the DWIC committee. Um, as of the new rules that were released last week, we can have parents and community representatives that are appointed by the board um, or recommendations from the superintendent, and this, there is no, there are no size limitations or parameters, so the committee could be as small as we want or as large as we want. And so what I've done is to put together a uh, potential timeline for us. Um, and, and it starts with tonight, with the board adopting the resolution. Um, then I would take it to DWIC next week and talk about the concept. Um, we'd have a public hearing next month and appoint a committee to develop a plan. Um, then the committee would work on that plan with some updates along the way to DWIC and to you all. Um, and then we would come back um, after Christmas and bring forth the final plan we have to post that for 30 days on the district's website before you all adopt it. And, and there are some requirements along the way to notify the commissioner of education. Although the commissioner doesn't have to approve the plan, uh, we do have to notify the commissioner. Um, and that's really it. Um, two thirds of the board has to vote on it. And then finally there on that last slide um, are, uh, is a list of districts that are currently um, designated as districts of innovations and I'll tell you I've looked at um, pretty much all of those plans um, that they're all uh, all those written plans are on the TEA's website and um, the majority of them are looking at the 90% instructional time the calendar options some certification issues there are about five or six issues that they're really focusing on kind of that low hanging fruit um, so to speak, and then um, some districts are coming together to continue to study exactly what we could be exempt from that we haven't even thought about yet. Um, I'll be joining a conference in uh, Keller ISD, or excuse me, Mansfield ISD on November the 7th to share some ideas, and of course I'll be looking um, to hear from you if you had any sessions at TASB or hear any information about what other districts are doing for District of Innovation. So that's it. So little fuzzy, right? Yeah. Uh, well, all we're doing, and, and I guess when this came out in legislation, it, there was some thinking that there'd be some really out-of-the-box thinking, innovative kind of things, yeah. and really it's become pretty simple sort of thing. But we need to get in the process so that we can begin to explore. Do we want to do something innovative? Do we want to just get some flexibility on the things that, that we want to be flexible on? Um, but it is interesting that really this motion is just to initiate the process of exploring. That's it's it. really not committing to anything, um, but it will enable you to pull together a, a committee of people that we will then appoint. So at this, assuming we pass this, the next step would be for us to sub recommend people that we might want to yes. serve on this for you. Could, for you you and, could make those recommendations other folks to me, throughout the district to and I will be working on the uh, forming that committee over the next month and bring that recommendation to you next month. Um, after the public hearing, but it will be in your agenda packet. Great. Anybody have any questions? 
about the initiating the exploration On that process? February 25th, you say commissioner <coughs> notified of the DOI plan. Mm -hmm. How long does it take for him to approve after that? Is there a um, process he, after that? He does not have to approve by legislation the plan, but we have to submit um, the plan to him. So there is actually no approval process, and any plan that we put in place can be up to good for up to five years. So, really, of course, now we, there are some things that we can't be exempted from. Right, right. There's some legal things that the um, state, the commissioners come out with a list of um, Texas Education Code, just a long list of things that we cannot be we exempted can't say from or federal guidelines. Testing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll, you know, we'll work to stay within the guidelines of things that we can um, have some flexibility with um, and then see what else we can come up with. Um, but there is no official approval process. It's just a notification back to him. This really may be a, a good one for, for y'all going to convention to go look, see if you can learn something uh, about what people are doing or what maybe some extra ideas that beyond what's been yeah, posted and the, on the website. The so. session I'm attending on November 7th will have TEA legal counsel and representation from their administration there. So we can ask some questions and hear some ideas from other districts as well. So it'd be interesting to, to explore. It was not something that was on our, we'd been listening. It was not something that we had intended to do other than just to read and follow a little bit. Um, however, with the calendar situation this year, we really decided we want to get on there and get in with it and see what we can do. Do you have a question? Some question, just a comment. Uh, a little further in the board packet. Thank you. A little further in the board packet where it lists the timeline again. It has the commissioner notified on February 28th. Do we have two dates? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We corrected one, so we must have missed one. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good catch. That's a great catch. So let's make sure we have it. That's not in the resolution, so... Um, There's no specific date the that you're required. Or, it's the just after the board adopts. Actually, could be pushed back if we're not ready to take action. It could be done in March or April or whatever, in theory. But this is a, a good timeline. Yeah, good the um, the thinking with the timeline <clears throat> is that we would have you all adopted at the same month that we typically adopt our calendar, which is typically February. Because that's, be good to get, that's something get we're definitely interested in. Terms interested of whether in. that's something we want to do. All right, so is there a motion to approve recommendation to approve this resolution to initiate the process of exploring it, the option of designating Belton ISD as a district of innovation? I have a motion from Mr. Cowan, second from Ms. Jordan. Any other comments or questions? All in favor of the motion? And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Good idea. Thank you. Oh, aren't you, uh, you want to? You want to go ahead and do that while you're there? You don't have your stuff. All right, let me, let me go ahead and we're, I want to make sure we don't start with recognitions before our students arrive. So, you got it? You want to go ahead and do the superintendent's report? Well, we can do <coughs> consent agenda also, but. <clears throat> okay, I have a few items for you this evening. Um, first thing is enrollment, and we can probably make that a little bit larger. Um, this is our enrollment as of last week. At that time, we had 11,092 students. That was 5,297 elementary students, 2,554 middle school students, and 3,241 high school students. Um, and as you'll recall, our demographer projected 11,201 students um, by the state's official count date of October 28th. So we're still over 100 students away from that projection. Um, we're continuing to watch that every day and follow our attendance, and we'll continue to keep you updated on and see how close we get. Last year, Bob nailed it um, with our demographic projection. This year, we may not quite reach it. <coughs> but that's still significant growth. Um, our demographics on the next couple of charts um, that Rachel put up there are pretty typical for us uh, with just a slight decline in the percentage of white students. We have 53.8% as compared to 55% last year. And then we have a slight increase in the percentage of Hispanic students. Can you make that larger? We were 32 point, perfect, 32.8% um, this year as compared to 31.9% last year. <coughs> 
And then our percent of students claiming two or more races has um, increased from 3.8% to 4.3%. And our African American and Asian populations are pretty steady at 6.6% .6 and 1.8% um, respectively. We've seen a slight decrease um, moving down to the bottom chart in the percentage of English learners. We're at 6.4% compared to 7.2% wow. last year. That's fairly significant for us. Um, and an increase in the percentage of economically disadvantaged students. We're at 48.2% compared to 46% last year. And then our percentage of military connected students um, is sitting at 7.9% compared to 7.6% last year. So we have a few more students there. Um, and then while our, our demographic picture of the district is shifting slightly over time, the biggest change, of course, is really in the number of students that we serve. Um, our demographics are pretty, pretty flat, and they have looked this way for a very long time. Um, we've just grown by about 3,500 <coughs> students over the last decade, and we are continuing to grow steadily. Um, Bob Templeton will be here in November um, after the snapshot data is all collected, and then he's going to provide you with an update. We'll talk about some future projections. Um, he's also doing some work with us now, um, just looking at um, neighborhoods and planning zones as well. Um, I did have down to talk to you about the food truck update. However, I think you all asked pretty much all the questions <laughs> that I had. Um, and so I just like to thank Susan D'Amico. Um, if she's in here, another round of applause for her. She's she may be not here. Cleaning the food truck. Um, and Phil Haggerty for their work on this project. Phil's, Phil's probably the, the expert food truck guy in the whole community. He knows a lot about food trucks. Um, we're really proud of this innovative approach to feeding our kids and um, it's going to allow us to feed more kids than we feed now and of course we hope that it'll generate additional revenue for our child nutrition department so that we can continue to be healthy there you know obviously we thank you uh, for those who are willing to do this this was a uh, um, stepping outside of the normal uh, expectations and doing something innovative and exciting mm -hmm. uh, our kids are excited about it people in the community and and for those of us who got to eat uh, and, and try the food, uh, it was really excellent. Uh, best tacos I've had in ages. So <laughs> that uh, uh, says a lot about our nutrition services department, but the opportunity for our kids. I'm, I'm excited about what this will do and just, just the energy that it brings, anything we can do to engage our students and, and uh, help them be excited about what's happening in school is a good thing. So. Great. And I think it's probably good for our staff, too. I think they're excited about it as well. Yeah. So. I, and I would like to remind you that this is a bus that we took offline. So this is <clears> one <throat> of our older school buses. Um, and so we didn't have the expense of purchasing a food truck. We, um, so we, that was a wash for us, we, and it made it even more economical for us, <laughs> the folks coming in. Also important to note, uh, Belton Education Richmond <clears throat> Foundation donated money to paint I believe to provide they paid for the uh, wrap. The wrap. It's not paint. I said paint. It's a wrap. But the the wrap. Uh, the the graphics on it. Uh, there's actually a beef logo uh, also on there. But the wrap, which is quite uh, striking, <laughs> impressive. So You'll know where you, to beef. You will know we're there. Okay. Auto tech update. Um, oh, there's a pass. You could go back to that. I mentioned in the cafeteria that we're, we'll have some passes for kids to get out to the food truck. Each campus will develop their um, own system for allowing students to go out to the food truck. I stole this from Ms., uh, Dr. Dubois' uh, tweet this morning, and uh, these are for his campus and the passes that students will get from their homeroom teachers to go out to the food truck. Okay, auto tech update. Wright Builders began work on August the 29th. Um, they began with over excavation of building, a, uh, building the pad to a depth of eight feet. On September the 6th, the contractor hit an eight inch fire main that was installed um, at a depth of four feet. Um, this line was not on any of our drawings um, or record by the the city of Belton and so we had to take some time to repair that the city of Belton um, did so and they've installed a new fire main around the site 
So we've pushed the substantial completion date of that project back to March the 29th. Okay, next is our Anti-Defamation League collaboration. One of the major strategies in this year's district improvement plan um, in goal three regarding personnel is to focus on diversity awareness and to ensure that we're creating all-inclusive environments for our students. And so as a part of our work, um, this year we've partnered with the Anti-Defamation League to train our administrators, instructional coaches, and counselors. Um, this month we had approximately 100 um, participants who um, who were here for a half-day session on uh, what the Anti-Defamation League calls a World of Difference Institute. Uh, some of the premises of the Institute are bias is universal, prejudice can be unlearned, respectful dialogue is needed, conflicts may arise, and um, diversity is a strength. And those are just some of the premises of the, of the Institute. We had a, a really good time with our facilitators talking about diversity um, and individuals. Um, our two facilita facilitators were Dr. Rochelle Warren and Jillian Bonke. Um, and because the day went so well, we're going to continue with another half day training session in February um, to continue that conversation. Also, in addition to the training um, that we had for our leaders, our elementary principals had the opportunity to hear an overview of the ADL's pro uh, program called No Place for Hate um, to, and to learn how they can receive a No Place for Hate designation for their campus. And that's a program that provides a way for schools to focus on creating inclusive environments for all students. And currently we do have one student that is a designated no place for hate school and that's Lakewood Elementary. Um, okay, professional development update. Um, our first campus professional development day for this year will be held on uh, one week from Friday on September the 30th. And our students will be off that day. Um, and just as a side note, we planned for that day specifically to be a professional development day because we have a Thursday night football game. So that's kind of significant. We had a late night last Thursday night and our kids had to get up and go to school on Friday and so did our staff. Um, but this next one that's on a Thursday evening, um, we'll have our students home resting the next day. Um, and because it's a campus staff development day, our schools are tailoring their professional development um, to meet their needs. Some campuses are focusing on instructional rounds work that we started last year um, and they'll be discussing topics such as Bloom's taxonomy, student discourse, and questioning strategies. Um, other campuses will use the day to review and discuss the data co collected from their internal rounds, which are inter internal instructional rounds that they hold on their campuses, again focusing on instructional practices. Um, several of our secondary campuses are focusing on student interventions and processes to support struggling learners. Somebody's really cute, I think. <laughs> you all are grinning at her. Um, we're also offering training for our fourth and fifth grade teachers by a Google consultant um, on the Google suite of applications such as Google Docs and Google Forms to support an iPad initiative um, at the elementary level. And then finally, um, we've contracted with Marzano Research to provide professional development at, for Miller Heights and Southwest Elementary teachers on building academic vocabulary. And so we're excited about that. Okay, and then last thing um, that I wanted to point out, you may have seen this on social media already, um, but this is our, these are our new tip line posters. Um, that were passed out earlier this month to our secondary principals, and I've already seen them on campuses. Um, these are newly designed to hang for our students to see so that we can encourage them to report any safety concerns, um, threats, or crimes that they know about. And so there are two versions of the posters. Um, this one says, your school, your big red community, your responsibility. I love that. Um, and, the, and the other one says, we're all tigers, and tigers protect each other. Um, so students can email, they can text, they can call and uh, let us know about any concerns that they have and all the information to do that is provided on the posters. And I would like to thank Robert Atmar for making that happen. That was another one of our goals for this school year um, and he's taking care of that. So thank you very much, Robert. Robert, good job. All right, that's all I have. Who actually answers that tip line? 
Mr. Atmore and one of our SROs are getting those tips. Mm -hmm. Good question. Any other questions about that? We have had a couple of tips, nothing major, but um, kids wanting to report some things, and so we've been able to follow up on a couple of tips that we've received right. already. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good deal, thank you. Okay, well, I think we have everybody here we're gonna recognize, but before we get to the recognitions that are on the agenda, um, I want to mention a few. Uh, first of all, Susan D'Amico has made it back in the room, so uh, special thank you for providing uh, not only our meal for this evening, but a great opportunity for our kids. We're so appreciative of the work that you did, the many, many, many hours that you spent researching this and bringing this to reality. Uh, uh, and I think Phil Haggerty was walking in the door when we were talking about that. Dr. King Cannon was, was mentioning it. Thank you all for the hours and the time and the investment you went to go research this, to bring the proposal to us and to make it a reality. Uh, wonderful meal, wonderful opportunity. Can't wait to hear the, the buzz that it creates on our campuses. Uh, I suspect you'll be back before long asking for a second one. So that, that's a great thing. <laughs> okay, no, not in a hurry to do that. Another thing, we have not met since school started, and it seems like a long time ago. I mean, we had a special meeting, but we haven't had our regular meeting since school started, and, and I wanted to just pause a moment to say a thank you to everyone who had a role in the beginning of school. Convocation was excellent. Uh, everyone who had a role in that, Kyle uh, DeBeer, I have lost Kyle. He's somewhere in here, I think, yeah, in the very back. Uh, and, and everybody who had a role in that uh, wonderful event. and. It's really important for us to remember that a smooth beginning to school doesn't happen by accident. It's the result of great planning and preparation by our, our administrators and our teachers and our staff to make sure everything's ready so that the first day of school, it's smooth and uh, it's wonderful to go into our schools and see education uh, happening from day one. So thank you all for what you're doing. Uh, also want to say a special thing, we did meet we had a special meeting. Those of you who may not be aware, we um, each year we have an annual board administration training uh, that is required, but it's an opportunity for us to get some training uh, specific to building team and to focusing on, on goal setting. And uh, Deanna Lovesmith uh, led that for us. Thank you, Deanna. And Amanda Necessary uh, was a big part of that because we met out in the CTE building and learned from um, our educators, our teachers who are working with our students. So special thanks to uh, Rebecca Alcozer and Craig Sullivan and Mark Fitzwater uh, for allowing us to come into their classrooms and learn a little bit and, and to understand why our students are so engaged in those CTE courses. So Deanna, thank you. Amanda, thank you. Susan and um, Ashley Nickerson provided dinner for us. Uh, great event, a lot of fun. We really appreciate them. And then one other I wanted to just mention, and Coach Shipley's not here, but I, um, uh, this is a celebration of community. Um, we had a really successful night on the football field in Round Rock last Thursday night. But more important to me than the win, which was really a big deal, a uh, great win for them, was the character and respect that our, our kids showed. Uh, there was a horrific, terrible injury to a uh, Round Rock player. And the way our kids responded to that both at the beginning of the game when it happened and then after the game going over and joining with the Round Rock team uh, was really impressive. Our, uh, for those of you that weren't there, when they, at the end of the game, uh, our kids were celebrating. It was, a, it was a very dramatic ending of the game. They were celebrating. But when they started playing their school song, all of our kids went over. Players and cheerleaders, everybody went over and stood behind them out of respect and then ran back over, did our school song, and then all of a sudden they all went running back because they saw their team huddled up uh, in prayer and our kids surrounded them. And the response from the Round Rock community um, heard from many people of how impressed they were with our kids, not separate apart from the game. And so I just want to say how proud I, uh, that was a, a great moment, how proud I was to, uh, to see our Belt and Tigers demonstrating the kind of character and the things that we want. Uh, to see so a great a great night representing belt and tigers so okay now let's get on to our recognitions that are on the agenda we're going to begin with an all-american guy you want to get us started well you don't get very many all-americans but we've got another one thank you mr another pittenger year. 
And uh, you're absolutely oh. right that we don't get many All-Americans. We've only had three in the history of Belton High School, and only one of those three has been an All-American in two consecutive years, and that's who we're honoring tonight. Uh, Noah Henry has been selected by the National Interscholastic Swimming Coaches Association for their All-America list in the 100-meter on backstroke up, don't be shy. in you the last to do this. two years uh, in a row. Yay. Two years in a row. Come on up, man. And uh, in the most recent year, he had the 34th fastest time of the swimmers on the list in the 100 meter backstroke and the second fastest time among swimmers in his grade. Wow. And that's amazing. <laughs> and what you're getting to do on a national level is, is what most people can't even imagine what it's like. You're getting to hang out and be in the pool and be around some, some incredible athletes that go to the Olympics. So, Noah. We're hoping you're going to be the, our first Belton student going to the Olympics, the Olympics. right? You yeah. live, on, live up to that. <laughs> <laughs> Families in the back, we are so proud of, of you all and, and what's happening. Noah, thank you for representing Belton and uh, doing a great job. We, we expect great things from you because we know you're headed in the right direction. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Okay, next we want to recognize some special students who have who've gotten to do some great things with uh, uh, Military Education, Child Education Coalition. The Military Child Education Coalition selected on, just Carol. 17 groups of students nationwide to participate in their national training seminar in a special student summit held during that seminar. And the Belton High School student to student group was one of those 17 clubs nationwide chosen. And so we had uh, four students who attended in June uh, MSEC's national training seminar and the student summit along with it. Those students are Lauren Ellis, Rebecca Sloan, Pablo Archuleta, and America McCoy. America is not able to be with us tonight. Um, and they went to Washington, D.C. with uh, the sponsor of Student to Student at Belton High School, who is Carol Ormond. Wait, don't leave, don't leave. I, I want to make sure everybody understands how big a deal this is. Belton High School got a special invitation. Other people had to apply and, and hope they were selected. Belton High School, because of reputation in previous years, participation and all, there was a special request please apply, we really want you here. And so uh, Carol brought in this group of students kind of at a very short notice and said, y'all got to produce a video, right? Yes. And One you did day. it in a day. <laughs> that was dazzling and impressive, yes. of course, and probably better than any of the ones that had been submitted yes. with months of preparation uh, and got invited to go. Great experience for y'all? Well, yeah. Did you learn a lot that's going to make a difference yes. for us? Yes. Great. Yes. We are really proud of the, the, uh, the Belton High School student to student program and excited that the student to student program is, has expanded to all of our campuses. Uh, but Carol and, and these students are doing a great job of leading this great program. Thank you all for what you're doing. We're proud of you. We appreciate you. You're making a difference. And this is good stuff. So thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we've got a fuel up to play 60. Well, you got a, a great look at the food truck tonight, and there are some uh, incredible things that came together to make that happen, and some of that is outside support. You mentioned earlier the support from the Belton Educational Enrichment Foundation. Through a competitive application process, the school nutrition department also was awarded a $5,000 Fuel Up to Place 60 program grant from Dairy Max. And that grant went to purchase the custom-designed coolers that are keeping milk cold for meal service on the truck. Very nice. That's I appreciate you, uh, Susan, again for going out and getting a grant. But uh, congratulations! A little added bonus for that. Okay, let's recognize some educators. How about the uh, Temple Rotary Club Educator of the Month, Calvin? Good evening. Yes, tonight we'd like to, uh, for the Temple Rotary Educator of the Month, we'd like to recognize Lindsay Turner. And Lindsay is a fourth grade teacher at Tarver Elementary, and she's in her 13th year in education. Come on, Michelle. And her ninth year with BISD. She serves as a grade level leader. She also serves on the campus instructional rounds team. And she pursues professional learning opportunities and always brings back her learning to the entire Tarver team. 
When she identifies a need, she steps up to assist. You'll often find her helping out on those cold and rainy days at arrival when it's dark. Um, if a staff member's out, she's stepping in and making sure the students and the substitute has what they need. Michelle Tish, principal at Tarver, stated, Ms. Turner truly has a heart for kids. She builds strong relationships with her students, and they know she cares about them. Lindsay is always pleasant, smiling, and laughing. Her students adore her, and she makes a huge impact on their lives. And, and I have it by good authority that, that you've got a mom who's just a, a long time super teacher too, who's been recognized and all. Mom, are you proud? <laughs> Did she do well? That's awesome. Congratulations. Uh, you already got to go to the Rotary Club luncheon, I understand. Well, congratulations. Thank you for what you're doing for our kids and we're glad you're getting recognized for your great work. Thank you for nominating. Okay, and now our, the Belton right, Rotary Club Educator of the Quarter. Educator of the Quarter. Um, Tammy Duffy, she's at Miller Heights. She is the PE teacher, and she's in her 18th year in education and her fourth year with us in Belton ISD. Ms. Duffy improves the lives of her students through engaging lessons and by continuously encouraging awareness of not only physical education, but also literacy, mathematics, nutrition, and anatomy and physiology. She's a positive voice for fitness and healthy choices, and she's an example, a great role model for her students. She serves as the lead organizer of the Proud to be American Day, and as a result of her involvement and support of others, she has earned a high level of respect for her students, peers, and parents. And Jennifer Connor, principal at Miller Heights Elementary, stated, Ms. Duffy, Ms. Duffy's eye for detail and skill for planning enable our Proud to be an American Day to be fun and engaging for the entire community. She is deserving of the Belton Rotary Educator of the Quarter because her, of her lasting commitment to her craft, her students, and our community. Congratulations. Excited. Very thankful, Belton Rotary Club. Have you been to lunch yet? Oh, you get to go to lunch with uh, Phil and Merle, I guess. That's what quite it. And Leo. I'm sorry. Leo will be there representing. That's right. I don't forget. Uh, that's right. Wow, that's quite quite a deal. Thank you. We appreciate you. Okay, next up, we want to recognize our Big Red community partners. Tonight, you'll be hearing an update on our advanced academic program. One of the great annual celebrations of the students who are part of the advanced academic program is our annual top 10 luncheon. BBVA Compass and Kela Home Builders come together to sponsor a luncheon for the top 10 graduates from Belton High School and from New Tech. It's a very special event and we're excited that Kela Home Builders is with us tonight as our Big Red community partner for September. You all have, have sponsored this for how many years? I think 10. Over 10, yeah, yes. over 10 years uh, taking care of those students, giving them something really special. That's a, a great it. event. We're glad to have added one and we hope to add yeah. another one. And we added New Tech High School last year. That's right. Actually, two years now. We've done New Tech High School. Yeah, yeah, both years. years. Right, right. So, and maybe someday a, another one in the future. Uh, Thank you yeah. for doing that. Great way to honor them in a special way. They get dressed up and take the limo ride and get a really nice treat. So thank you for what you're doing and making a difference. Great community partners. We appreciate you. Uh, BBA VA Compass also uh, unable to be here, but we thank them, right? Partnership. Great. All right. Do we get all the recognitions taken care of? Okay, we can move now to uh, public comments. I didn't see anybody who had signed up. Um, any takers on public comments? Seeing none, we'll move to the consent agenda. Does anybody have an, any items they'd like pulled from the consent agenda for discussion? Okay, let me identify those items. We have the minutes of the August 15th, 2016 regular meeting, the August 29th special uh, meeting, uh, mentioned of our training out CTE. The unaudited financial report for the month ending August 31st, 2016, which ends the year for us. Uh, and we'll get an audited financial report in a few months. We have gifts, grants, and bequeaths of less than $1,000 on page 55. You'll see some of those. Those do not require board approval, uh, but they're, uh, we certainly appreciate those folks. And then we have other revenues of at least 1000 but less than $10,000. Um, Sparta PTA donated. $9,999 to support the purchase of iPads and OtterBoxes for classroom use. 
and South Belt Middle School PTA donated workout equipment valued at $2,203.90 for staff use to promote health and wellness on the campus. Um, just want to mention, I'm going to mention this later at the end, but I'd like for us to look at our policy uh, because obviously the intent of our policy is to set a limit, but um, it looks like we're gaming that a little bit here and, and uh, we need to maybe change our policy so that it, it doesn't uh, require Jason, somebody to, to take a dollar. Our policy says that anything up to over $10,000 would require the board to take action before they could accept it. And so we've authorized the superintendent to accept anything up to 10000 uh, and then we would approve it after the fact. Um, the, the thinking on policy is that you sometimes when people donate funds, they expect something in return. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that we look at our policy and think about booster clubs and PTAs being in a different category and, and that we could authorize the superintendent uh, to do this so they don't get into this. We've seen this happen. They've got to $999 to prevent from getting to the $1,000, uh, or this one in this case, um, $1 under the, the threshold, um, which certainly we don't want to slow down the process, but that's not the intent of the policy. So, the, and so, so I think that the thinking is, is that they don't want to wait a month to get yeah. the board approval before they spend the money. And so um, and, yeah. that's why they're coming in right yeah. under the number. So anyway, yeah. in the consent agenda is for us to approve this. We have, to my knowledge, I don't recall ever having not accepted a donation from a PTA. I can't imagine not doing that. Uh, but um, seems a little odd that they took a dollar off so that they could avoid getting board approval. So we may want to look at that. At this point, it's on our uh, agenda to approve. We have. The supply equipment service bids for sign safety and identification products and supplies, RFP 16077431382 to approve the vendor list. Uh, contract is effective July 31st, 27 through July 31st, 2017, with the option to renew for three one year, additional years, one year at a time. Uh, we have expenditure over 50,000. We have an equipment and services from NetSync Up Network Solutions supporting 2016-17 Belton ISD E-Rate Category 2 Wireless Upgrades. This is for RFP 15129151124 and RFP 15129151125. This is to approve the expenditure to upgrade the district switch infrastructure and wireless access points in the amount of $905,000 expense, which is included in our budget. However, it also has an approximate 60% federal E-Rate reimbursement. Um, so it's planned expenditure. Uh, we have the 2016-17 out of district transfer report. Uh, this is a report only. We approve the policy and the, and the administration implements that policy. So it's a report only, uh, but it does indicate 451 transfers, which is approximately 4% of our total enrollment. Uh, significantly to note, half of those are employees, however. Um, and it's also significant to note that we have consistently had about the same number yeah, of same number transfers out of the district as we have in. And so it uh, one of the myths is that that's a much larger number, and it, it's not. Um, and then we have the appointment of the 2016-17 School Health Advisory Council. We appreciate those uh, folks who are willing to represent. I think this year, Stratmar, we have a record number of parents. Uh, percentage is higher <laughs> than even normal. We uh, Several years ago, we used to struggle with getting enough parents to because you have to have a majority of parents, and, and we have a, a very strong majority of uh, percentage of parents that are not employees. Uh, so that's wonderful to see, and we, we're appreciative of those folks. They do great work. Then we have the waiver request for maximum class size. Dr. Kincannon mentioned this. This is for nine sections at three schools. Um, uh, so not very many this year. Uh, low. But, but there still is a need for that waiver request. We do have to submit to TEA. It's expected to be approved. We have the certified T-test appraisers and calendars for 2016-17. Uh, this list uh, of all of our approved uh, folks who are our administrators and, and supervisors who have been through the training, I wanted to just uh, mention to the board that I'm, I'd be willing to bet there's not a, a school district over 10,000 students whose superintendent <laughs> has been through this training and is T-test certified. It says something about our district and our superintendent willingness to do that. Uh, training and understand training. what's happening. It was so. excellent training. Um, 
but that doesn't ordinarily happen. Then we have the 2016-17 contract for occupational and physical therapy services with Growing Places Therapy uh, Services, PLLC. Uh, this is uh, for pediatric physical, occupational, and speech therapies to authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute a contract. Um, and, and these are budgeted funds. And uh, this is a renewal of a contract we've had in place at least since 2014, as I understand. Uh, we have policy update 105 affecting local policies. This is a second reading of a number of local policies, BJCF, BQ, CLB, CLE, CPC, DBA, DFBB, DFFA, DFFB, EHBD, and FDC. Uh, all of those local policies uh, on the TASB instruction sheet. A special thanks to Angela for providing us with the, the chart showing what the changes are and significant impact to the district for all of those. And then we have an unusual board policy update 106. This actually is an emergency, uh, considered an emergency adoption because we are not having the normal one month delay because uh, TEA just uh, put out their ruling recently and uh, we have to implement it. So it's a local policy, but it's mandated by the state. So we don't, it's not like we have a choice here. Uh, it is related to the installation and operation of video and audio equipment in certain special education classrooms or other special education settings. It is significant to note that this has a potentially significant expense uh, without any additional funding from the state. This is a classic unfunded mandate uh, that could be a, a significant cost to local school districts. Um, and as we were coming before the meeting started, the Attorney General has ruled that uh, the way they wrote this law doesn't seem to be what their intent was. Nevertheless, we are required to adopt it. That's the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? Motion from Mr. Norwood, second from Mr. Carruthers. All in favor of the motion, raise a hand. That passes unanimously. Now we can move on to employment. HR, Mr. Schiller. Yes, sir. This month we have uh, nine recommendations that you can see in your packet. Um, one of those is a Belton ISD graduate, uh, Tara Panarts. Um, so we're excited to, to have her helping us out with uh, being an ag teacher for us. And um, in addition to that, we received two resignations. You can also see some new positions that we're recommending um, based on student growth uh, with the district. You mentioned those new positions uh, Again? and kind of where we're at with that. Sure. Uh, kindergarten teacher for Southwest, third grade teacher uh, for Lakewood, fourth grade teacher for Chisholm Trail, and then a part-time foster care homeless liaison position. And uh, all those positions are all filled. All those are filled. Where new positions are filled. And actually, at this point, we're full. We have no teaching positions available at this time. How often have you said that? Not very often. <laughs> and so, at a September meeting. At a September meeting. We've got two recommendations that we're finalizing up that we will provide with you all next month, but at this very second, we're full. Wow, that's great. Uh, good news uh, for us. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Motion to approve. Motion from Mr. Camden, second from Mr. Carruthers. Any comments? All in favor of the motion? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, okay, Deanna, you're going to talk to us about the accountability report. I am. As soon as I get it up there. Okay, great. So um, tonight I want to present to you uh, the accountability report for the 2015-16 school year a little bit of a delay from in the past, uh, just waiting for the state to get all of their um, changes and scores in. Um, before I begin, I would like to um, give some credit to Don Schiller, who is our new Director of Accountability for this year, who was significant in helping get this presentation together. Um, so our goal tonight is to just briefly go over the very complex accountability system, um, but to kind of give you an over, um, overview of where we stand. And so first and foremost, we want to congratulate the district and all campuses for meeting standard um, on the new accountability on the accountability system, um, meeting it at the highest expectation level, which is um, index one, but we met it in every area. So and I'll, I'll explain that. Yes. Can I back up mm -hmm. just a minute? I just want to make sure we're all clear. This is based on tests taken last spring. That is correct for the 15. And we didn't 16. take them in the summer. 
although we <laughs> thought we, we were going take, to. We didn't take the fifth and eighth Don't grade in some. the summer, but we took some, and then the state uh, delayed getting those results back and calculating those, and then there were some testing errors with the state they had to work through and so we now have all of our reports in and confirmed so i get and and i'm, I'm sorry to interrupt i know you're on a roll but you're fine this is a significant uh, accountability year because the state acknowledged to us months ago that the system was flawed mm -hmm. and that the data was flawed mm -hmm. but they went ahead and and are putting this out now i'm glad that we're still met standard and that would be our expectation but I would say there's a big asterisk on this report because the state's already acknowledged that it's flawed data. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? That is. That is. Um, there were our, our folks we across the state experienced many errors with students and individual students taking tests and errors with student with with tests. And so um, yes. And there was not the capability for student many students to retake the tests as we've had in previous years. That's correct. So our students were not right. able to retake an assessment in the fifth and eighth grade. And as you'll recall, since we're talking so. about that, we had put in place the remediation for our kids. And we were in the middle of remediating those students to prepare them for that opportunity when we were notified that Friday afternoon. That the, the reason that I bring that up, and I think it's important to, to say at the outset of, of a, a very good report, and obviously our, our results are really mm -hmm. good. Um, they would be better if the system worked. Mm -hmm. You could always, um, anytime you allow students to retest an opportunity, sure. um, then you can see scores. And in, in this test, um, it's all tests that are taken. And um, with our current accountability system, the expectation is that all students, as high number as possible, take the on grade level assessment so that we'll also test many of our special education students who um, may be below grade level or have a learning disability and are still expected to test on grade level. So it includes everyone in that in that group. And um, we re so um, despite some of those variables that might have been against us in a difficult testing year, we did um, accomplish for all of our campuses to to meet the standard. And and like I was um, saying, they met every single area on all four indexes. And that's important because that's not easy to do. And that takes a lot of leadership and solid teaching in our classrooms and with all kids. And we feel like um, our folks are doing that and they've worked hard. Um, we did have um, 17,569 tests administered for the 15, but who's counting, right? Um, <laughs> but if we were counting, that's what we had. And um, across the state, 94% of the districts and 88.4% of districts met that standard, but in Belton, 100% met it. So we're proud of our, our again, of our folks. Um, so not to bog you down in all the complexities of the system, but just so you'll have a general overview, there are four indices. The first one does look at student achievement. This is all test for all students, and for this year, math was added back. So we had, last year we didn't have math in the system, it was a new test. This year, math for third through eighth grade was put back in. Student progress is index two. That is where you're looking at did the student meet, um, make one year's gain from the prior year. Three is where you're looking at closing the gap. So the state specifically looks at your lowest economic students and then also your two lower performing areas by ethnicity. And then, and that changes for every campus, so it's dependent on the individual campus. And then four is the post secondary ready, readiness. And there, they're really looking to see did students perform at the advanced level, which is the highest they could in that highest range on the test. So for Belton ISD, we listed in your packet the four. Um, at the top, you can see the state requirement to meet standard. So index one was a 60, and in Belton, this is a 79. And that's a calculated percent when they take into account every test that every student took in every subgroup, and then they give you an average and you can see for the district we met all, all four indexes and then for high school this is going to be focused specifically on your end of course exams we have those five end of course 
Algebra 1, English 1, English 2, Biology, and U.S. History. And again, both of our high schools um, exceeded the index requirement for all four indices. Our middle schools, um, they also exceeded for all four, and, and this is applicable for everyone, but I just want to remind you, the way the system calculates when you meet standard, the state will allow you to either meet the index one, which is the highest expectation, which is all kids taking all tests. If you do not meet index one, they'll default to index two and just say, well, if you didn't get everybody to pass, did everybody make growth? And our schools met, again, both of those standards. And then all of our elementaries and their indice scores, and they also all met. Um, index is an overview, and so we get this rating from the state, and this is what uh, determines our overall rating, but this is not um, where it stops for, for us and how we look at data. So um, we look at these numbers first and see our rating, but then we really start to dissect. And so um, a team from CNI, Dawn, and um, Vicki's also been working with her, will be going out. We work with every principal to look at safeguards. So those are coming out now. We, we dissect this data down by every grade level, every subject, and then we also look at student expectations. So this is just the real high overview. And then following these ratings, our campuses receive what are known as distinctions. So distinctions just came out. They look at the how you perform, no, now not compared to a state bar or a state expectation, but how you perform within the top 25% of your comparison group. So the state, what they do is they take your campus, they find the 40 schools in the state that they deem to be most like your campus in relation to the size of your campus, the um, lowest socioeconomic percentage, the other eth ethno ethnicity percentages, and your mobility rate. And they say these schools are most like you. Now they're only looking at that data. So as we've started to, and our principals start to dissect, they'll, you may find differences within how the community set up, their school calendars, I and mean, there's all kinds of things that play into the variables of schools. But they take this group, and this group can change from year to year, and they determine how you're performing. We received 27 distinctions among all of our campuses in these seven areas. So within each of the seven areas, they compare you against those 40 schools. And if you fall in the top quartile, then you um, will receive that distinction. Distinctions are not just based on test performance but they include multiple criteria. So they look at your attendance rate, they look at your um, percent that did master the test, they might look at your AP participation rate for high schools and post-secondary, they could be looking at percentage passing on AP tests. There's, um, it ranges for each, each area, it could be five criteria up to 10 and then you get you earn a certain percentage. So it's a very kind of calculated formula. But what it does for our principals is it really allows them to see where they compare to schools like them. It gives them a list of 40 schools to look at. Um, I've talked with several principals who are um, looking to see who's in their comparability group over multiple year span. So who's kind of all who are they always like and then what might they learn from them. And then I'm sure other districts across the state are finding our schools in those 27 and saying what might we learn from from Belton so it's a real learning tool to just get better and then I'd like to end this with um, a, a quote that we often use and we talk about uh, and this is that this is one measure of um, how we look at student success in Belton ISD we of course look at our student scores but we continue to look at participation of our students in our fine arts programs, our CTE programs, our athletic programs, our All-Americans that are here tonight. Um, there's many, many ways to look at uh, success of a school district, and we continue to embrace that. And I appreciate you saying that. Because while we expect to do well on these, this is not the most important thing we do. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the character and the lessons that our students are learning, the leadership they're getting, uh, means a great deal. 
Uh, but it's a good report. Does anybody have any questions, follow up uh, about this? It's good results. Obviously, we'll continue to look at that data and see where we go from here. You never know what the state's going to do. Um, I know uh, Sue and, and Mike, y'all will be down delegate assembly and, and the convention. You'd be interesting to hear what the buzz is about uh, the continuing uh, movement against high stakes testing and the usage of it and the overuse of it. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, energy out there uh, that, that how how it's harmful to public education and, and really isn't well designed for what we need to do. So be interesting to hear what you hear from that. So next month, y'all are going to be on the agenda to give us some <laughs> feedback about what you hear. So take good notes. Uh, going for us. Okay, thank you. We thank appreciate you. that. Well, um, actually, it, it is uh, not coincidental. It's strategically planned that because that's this is one measure, another measure of how we do as a district uh, is is what we do with our gifted and talented and in academic programs and so uh, Sam give us uh, give us an update on this aspect of our students well good evening it's my pleasure uh, this evening to give you the advanced academic report to talk a little bit about what we did last year and kind of some things that we're doing this year um, as we see if I can get this to work here no no let me try that. There we go. All right. <clears throat> um, I'd like to start out with our district evaluation of the GT program. Um, as you guys probably remember, this is our third year in a row to use the uh, evaluation standards that come in line with the Texas Association of Gifted and Talented Recommendations. One of the things I really like about this rating standard is that it allows campuses to have a direct input. It's not just me. And uh, the first time we did it, I think we learned a lot, and uh, we, you know, we got some pretty good, uh, tough evaluation out there, and so we're getting better. As you can tell, our, our overall rating is exemplary. It's we were exemplary, exemplary last year also, but I'm going to show you on the next slide where we've made a little bit of progress here. What in particular? Um, if you go down and look at the total line <clears throat> down below each of these areas of evaluation. You'll notice that we're sitting at 12 in the exemplary column. Last year, that number was 10. So we picked up two. Now, when you're doing an evaluation like this, growth is going to be small. We're not going to pick up, you know, five at a, at a shot here. So we picked up two, and I'd like to highlight what those two were. Uh, the first is up in student assessment. Um, this we picked up because we actually closed the gap a little bit in the district in terms of identifying Hispanic students in relation to their portion of the population. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit later, a little bit more. But <clears throat> that, that's a big deal for us. That's an area we needed to work on. So we were able to pick up, uh, pick up that point there. And the other point we picked up is in professional development. <clears throat> and that particular uh, quality point had to do with providing training or uh, professional development in terms of nature and needs of gifted kids for our mentors or other people that work with our kids on a voluntary basis. So this we actually picked up through our parent-teacher um, committee that we have that meets four times a year. And uh, it's a very active organization and we were able to uh, get that point in there because of that. If you look down at the bottom of the page, we look at how the campuses did. <clears throat> and I think this is a really good point to look at here. We didn't have any that rated themselves this last year as just acceptable. We moved up. We moved up from having seven in acceptable to having 29 up in, in the recognized column, but more importantly, uh, this percentage-wise, 71% uh, in the exemplary column. Now, I think our campuses are doing a good job. They're paying attention to this evaluation and uh, taking it seriously, and I'm getting some really good comments back with regard to things that we need to work on. So. I think it's a good tool. Sam, I just would just mention in agreement with you. I think evaluating yourself often has a. We, we tend to be more critical when we evaluate ourselves, even than when somebody out external comes and evaluates us. But it it's a motivator. Sure. To to achieve, and I know our folks well enough to know there's a little bit of a, or a lot of, <laughs> of competitive pride <laughs> you think? that goes on. Just a little. <laughs> I do, and it's and it's a good thing because we want 
to exceed, which is that exemplary concept. We want to be the best and provide the best opportunities for our students. So having that self-evaluation process, I think, really feeds that in a positive way. Well, and the other nice thing about this is that you can always continue to grow with it. So exactly. even if we get all these things, we can still keep fleshing out what we're doing to be at that level. So um, I'd like to show you on our GT testing. Um, last year, we talked a little bit about um, the idea that we needed to uh, raise the general intellectual index that we were using to identify students, um, which is basically the IQ score. So we raised that score from a, a 116 up to a 120, which brought us in line with the other districts in our area. <clears throat> um, it also, as you can tell, it, it lowered a little bit our identification percentage. Uh, as of the snapshot on August 29th, we had 8.44%. I know that the superintendent just put a slide up that had 87 but her data is more recent than mine, so that's about to that credit okay. one. Anyway, um, our federal target is five, but understand that's just a target. I mean, we, we can do what, we're going to identify the kids that are gifted and, and serve them. But I do want to show you that in 2015-16, uh, we tested 316 kids and we placed about 35%. Um, looking at that, you would think, well, we probably want to place more than that if we're going to test. But I want you to be aware that this is the first year that we raised that bar. And I think we're kind of going through a process of calibrating where uh, when the people submit these applications to us, they're getting used to the idea that the standard is a little bit higher than it was before. And I think that will work itself out to where that percentage of identification will eventually work its way up. Uh, placement. Any questions about that? Okay. In terms of uh, placement by ethnicity, this is an area that I identified last year that I said we needed to work on. Um, in particular, I wanted to work on the Hispanic number. Um, I'm really proud of what we've done. If you look at from 14-15 uh, to 15-16, significantly increase the uh, percentage of Hispanic students placed. And, and that was done through kind of a series of, of uh, intentional things. We did some pretty focused professional development. Uh, we brought in Dr. Joy Esquerdo from UT Pan America, who is uh, redoing basically the Renzulli scales, which are scales that we use, teachers and parents use to identify uh, gifted kids. And she's redoing them from the slant of how did we miss, how did we miss the culturally specific characteristics that we might not identify on our own. So anyway, we brought her in and, and talked to, to people, and I think that did a really good job. And then the other thing that I'm really excited about, and I talk about it on the next slide, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about it now too, is that this last year we did a little test. We, we went back and we tested every second grader on one campus to see how effective we were being in our identification. In other words, you know, if we just test them all, are we going to find some that we miss through our normal identification process? So we went out to Southwest and we tested every second grader. And it was a small group. About, we had about well less than 50 kids. But out of that, we discovered that we had 12 kids that we could identify. We could go back and do the subsequent testing and all, all of them placed who would not have been identified through the normal screening procedures. That's not knocking our procedures. It's the same that everybody uses it. But it's just a recognition that so much of that is based on the human factor of picking and identifying people. So when we go out and screen everybody, we get different numbers. So this year, we're going to add another campus. This year, we're going to go out and look at Miller Heights and see what that does for us. And if it shows us the same thing, then next year I may be coming to you and saying, I'd like to do this as a district and screen it. You know, specific oh. levels. So anyway, it's too early to say that now, but it, but it is definitely a thing we're looking at. <clears throat> uh, some things we're doing in the, in the GT world. Uh, last year I told you we were going to uh, meet to try to standardize our elementary delivery because we had kind of different delivery on each campus. Um, this year is the first year that we're actually implementing that. What we agreed on, the committee met, we talked to uh, principals, came to the conclusion that we would provide 90 minutes per week of dedicated GT instruction on each elementary campus. Uh, that's in addition to the differentiation that's required by, by law on a continuing basis. 
So that looks a little bit different on every campus, but still it's 90 minutes per week, which I think is a big step forward. This year we're going to look at our middle school program. I'm not saying that it's broken, but I'm saying we ought to look at it and see if we're, we're doing the best possible thing we can with that time and for those kids. So we've formed a committee. We're going to look at it and see what we come up with and uh, see if we need to think about maybe changing that for next year or tweaking it a little bit. And then I just talked to you about the uh, whole grade GT testing at grade two. One of the areas that uh, pertains to uh, the gifted students, I know you all like this one, is a Duke Talent Search. Um, by the way, I'm going to put in a selfish plug. Tomorrow night is the Junior Scholar Ceremony at the Performing Arts Center at Belton High School at 6 p.m. You have a reserve seat. Please come. Bring your friends. It's a great time. It's in and out. It's a lot of fun. It's just recognizing kids for it's a great doing way to recognize great. their students. You know, that's a good it. Photo op. It's just good stuff. So uh, anyway, if we look at this, uh, what we've got is pretty consistent um, performance here. Go down and look at total qualified for grand recognition. This year we bumped up from one to two, and we might say, okay, two's not many, but let me tell you, two is a tough nut to crack. That's that's hard to get to because this is based on. Up at the top, that's the total number of kids that we identified from this junior scholar group who actually enrolled in Duke. And then the number below that is the number that went out and took the SAT or the ACT because they're qualified to do it as seventh graders, right, to take it. And then everything below that is a result of how they did on that test. And so if we go down and we look at it, we had 14 students out of that 53 that qualified for state recognition based on a score they took in seventh grade sitting next to 11th graders, mm -hmm. right, which, which is really pretty cool. And just to give you an idea, uh, if you took the ACT, you would have had to have made at least a 22 on the ACT in order to qualify for state recognition. If you took the SAT, you would have had to, had to have had a 550 on uh, the math score in order to, and a five, uh, well, 550 in both. Uh, the English category too in order to qualify for that. When we get down to grand recognition, this is really cool. These are the guys who actually could go to Duke if they wanted to and walk across the stage at Duke University. And in order to do that, they had to score a 29 on the ACT, which is a near perfect score. This is diff difficult, very difficult to do. So Sam, so, our, our students who were recognizing tomorrow night will sign up and take the SAT or the ACT, and they will take it with high school students. Correct. Yes, correct. That's part of this program is they're, yeah. they're allowed, because they're part of it, to they, sign up for the ACT Saturday or the SAT and take it take one it. time. Yeah. Right? And they're really, it's funny, they're really scary, and all the parents will come up after the thing, and they'll say, what should I do? What should we take? What do we do? And I was like, chill, it doesn't, just one, just take one, pick one. It's all right. Uh, seventh grade. It's just the beginning, yeah. just to start. But anyway, this is a really good little program, and uh, our kids are doing well in it and continue to. So please come tomorrow. Um, I also wanted to let you know we had uh, GT summer camp again this summer. We had two weeks of it. This is a great program. This year we had it at New Tech High School, which was which was new. Traditionally, we've had it at one of the middle schools, and New Tech volunteered to host it, and they were fantastic. It was a wonderful setting. Uh, we had 197 kids that came out in grades 3 through 8, uh, which is 8% more than we had last year. Um, I know we like pictures, so I thought I'd show you just a few. And I don't know if you can see those very well, but it can just kind of give you an idea of the activities we do there. Uh, one of them up in the corner is doing your own newscast, um, creating a news show. And uh, Kristen came in and saved the day and gave us a talk about the newsroom back in the back there and uh, did a great job. The one, uh, the girl in the middle there is designing your own computer game. Uh, we had some ecology workshops there. We had uh, Defying Gravity where we're doing egg drop devices. We had uh, neuroplasticity where we're actually carving up a sheep brain here. Did a double take on that one. And uh, anyway, good stuff, good stuff. Kids had a lot of fun and we look forward to doing it again this summer. And by the way, this is free to any identified a tremendous student. opportunity for our kids uh, yeah all right let's move on to AP um, AP exams and students something we always want to know about now I want you to 
really, when you look at these scores, you have to kind of think of 2015 as a tad bit anomalous because it's just that was just such a group. I mean, it's it, but if we go over and, and look at it from the perspective of from 2011 marching onward, it, it's a steady progress. I mean, it, we're we're really doing well here. At 738 AP exams, 369 students, 228 with a three plus, which was one more than we had last year, even though we had that huge glob of kids that were taking tests. So we're doing really good. Same thing with percentages of AP students at three, with a three plus. Uh, we are above the state average and we're above the global average and actually above last year, 2015. So doing well. <coughs> AP scholars. No, we're excited about this one. I am. Because last year, when I put that number 100 up there, I <laughs> thought, this is never going to happen again. I'm going to have to get, leave now before these <laughs> statistics come out again because to hit, a, to hit 100 is pretty unusual. But we actually upped it by one. But what I really want to point out is the level of distinction that we've, that we've got going here. We moved in 2016. Many of our kids from the lowest level of honor, which is AP Scholar, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we move them up to AP Scholars with distinction. So it's a huge difference, really. It's, and if you look at the requirements in order to do that for an AP Scholar with distinction, you've got to score an average of 3.5 out of 5 on every AP exam that you take, and you've got to have a score of 3 or higher on 5 or more exams. So, I mean, these kids are working hard, and it's pretty phenomenal. To, uh, to get this and to have five national AP scholars those guys had to average a four on everything they took and had to have a four or higher on eight or more exams so pretty good good kids good kids and teachers teachers are doing a phenomenal job there all right in terms of dual credit I wanted to, to give you the numbers again this year because dual credit continues to be a very important program to us um, what we're looking at here is total numbers of participants. Um, so you're going to have, for example, you might have a kid who's taking a class at UMHB and at Temple College. So they're, they're going to be up there and, and wherever they're reflecting. Um, this is the first year that I put anything up there for UTPB. That's kind of an interesting thing for us that's uh, only online. So we had six students from BHS that are taking dual credit classes through UTPB online. And we'll see how that goes and you know that more than my guess would be that that element of dual credit will continue to grow that the online approach will anyway very healthy approach 197 students averaging 10 college hours per student so even though we had fewer students than last year we had more hours per student this year makes sense what's our uh, do we know yet what our numbers look like this year uh, I don't have those for this year, okay. but uh, I usually let things kind of stabilize and then start looking at that. I, so I guess it is week five now. All right, credit by exam. I wanted to point this out to you because last year I told you this was going like wildfire, and it and it's it's continuing to do so. Uh, we we increased about 84 uh, percent in terms of credit by exams from last year, the year before, over last year. And uh, this is an area that's just continuing to grow. And what we're, where I'm really seeing the growth, of course, of course we do it to identify kids in our language program that we want to accelerate ahead. But I'm also seeing uh, quite a few parents calling wanting to accelerate a grade. Now, the way this works is in elementary school, you, you have to accelerate the entire grade. In middle school or high school, you can accelerate through a subject. So middle school or high school, you could accelerate out of English, for example, to the next level. But in elementary school, the only way to tackle that is to do it by grade. It's a tough nut to crack. But a lot of parents are interested in that because it is a national movement right now. Across the country, the acceleration movement is really taking off. So I think that's going to continue to grow. Okay, I, I just have to say yes, this. Sir. I'm sorry on this. I learned from a kindergarten teacher a long time ago uh -oh. that education is not a race. You're right. And, You're right. And rather than trying to get from point A to point B as fast as you can, you ought to go as much as you can while you go. Learn as much as you can while you go from point A to point B. And that kindergarten teacher's lesson has stuck with me. And so 
it, it worries me when I hear you say that. But people have choice, and we need to provide options. But I would certainly counsel people to get as much as you can in the limited amount of time you have, and don't get in a hurry because you can't go back. Believe me, when a parent suggests this to me, we have some serious conversations, conversations at the school level, then I talk to them and we look at whether or not they really want to do this. And ultimately it comes down to the parent decision because we have to provide it for them if they request it. But we do we do talk about all that. But I'll call you the next time I get a parent. <laughs> I'll let you talk. Well, to I them. have no illusions of <laughs> talking to somebody out of that. I'll no, just I, tell no, you, no, no, no. I was one of those parents who thought I we needed right. to hurry along, and I got a, sat down, and it was explained some, to me. Some better. do, but yeah. most don't. So, so we have to be really careful about it. There are some it. kids who need to move on. Sure, who I are ready that. to move academically. That. And but, people need to have options. Yeah. And I, sure. Yeah. Sure. Understand that. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, last but not least on our college prep, I just wanted to throw these numbers up for you. Last year you asked specifically about college entry testing, so I thought I'd give you, give you another year of that. Uh, we've seen our SAT and ACT and TSI numbers growing. Um, the TSI, remember, is a test that you take if you don't qualify with SAT or ACT or you need a, another or you just haven't taken it yet and need an admissions mm -hmm. credential. One thing I want to point out about this that's new for us and interesting is that this year, New Tech High School and Belton High School in the spring will become TSI testing sites. Now, before we had to use Temple College and they would come over and do it and they also charged our kids considerably more money than we're going to charge our kids. So in the spring, BHS and Belton right. New Tech will become testing sites and our kids will just test through those centers Great. there. That's a good thing. Uh, we are continuing our Kaplan program. Uh, we have two PSAT sessions going on right now. We have an SAT that's about to start in the spring. We'll do an ACT and an SAT. And last but not least, I wanted to highlight to you, just remind you that we do have a continuous PSAT testing program that starts in the eighth grade. And they'll take the PSAT eight and nine. And then in the 10th and 11th grade, they take the PSAT National Merit Scholar Qualification Test. That's what NMSQT stands for. Um, and then um, on to the SAT. So we have a pretty robust uh, testing system up from the 8th grade up to the 11th grade in terms of SAT prep. So do you have questions for me? All right. Well, We're moving in the right direction you. and appreciate the work you're doing to help us get there. And well, thank you, sir. Excited about the opportunities that our kids have um, all from at all levels. So thank, well, thank you, you for that. We appreciate well, that. I'm excited about the food truck. All right. I'm this is not <laughs> this is not a, a, an action <laughs> item. This is a report only, and we also have our third report only. This one's on safe and civil schools. So, uh, Dr. Trejo. Oh, there we go. It's working. Well, I'm excited to talk to you a few minutes tonight about safe and civil schools, and Emilio uh, from the DAP will be joining me as well uh, to discuss some of the things that are going on there with safe and civil. Um, just to get started, I want to explain that safe and civil schools is not really a program. It's really a set of strategies and materials that help educators, school personnel, um, maintain good discipline and behavior on campuses and also help with safety and civility. And when implementing, implementing, implementing safe and civil schools, it helps educators really build a solid foundation so that the focus can remain on student learning and we can have high levels of student engagement. And so the goal of the program and the goal in our district is really to create a full continuum of behavior support for students so that we can make sure that uh, school is a great place for all of our students. And so some of our core beliefs in Belton ISD that are similar to the ones that Safe and Civil Schools supports is that every student must be treated with dignity and respect. And um, that it is our responsibility to teach um, the skills that students need um, so that they can exhibit good behavior. And it's also our core belief that it is our responsibility to have positive interactions with students and that when students do misbehave, it gives us an opportunity to teach students about what is appropriate and good behavior. And so each year, each campus, every single campus puts together a safe and civil school team. And it's a committee of school personnel 
um, that comes together to look at things on the campus, um, look at school data, and put together a plan and implement, and implement a plan for um, the year to ensure that there is good uh, behavior on the campus. And so this particular committee, they meet yearly, sometimes monthly, sometimes bi-monthly. They look at campus data. Um, they make recommendations, uh, for example, um, a campus may be having more tardies than they want to, so they may make some recommendations um, for some strategies to improve uh, attendance or tardiness. And that particular committee um, pretty much drives all of the safe, safe and civil school processes and initiatives on the campus based on individual campus data. And um, also, the uh, safe and civil school committee members are represented on the district-wide safety uh, committee. And so what we're doing in our district is really, uh, like I mentioned before, developing a whole system of behavioral supports from the district level as a whole, um, at each campus, in, in, the, in each individual classroom, and also implementing behavior supports for those particular students who really struggle with behavior. And so uh, we're focusing this year on four pieces of safe and civil schools um, and focusing on those to make sure that we have good implementation of those particular pieces. And one of the main, main ones is guidelines for success. And these particular guidelines represent a set of skills that we want every student, every staff member to exhibit on a regular basis um, on the campus. And the one you see um, posted now is actually Joan Pertle's guideline for success, and it's also called the Pertle Pledge. And um, at Pertle, that students recite this every morning over the morning announcements. You'll find their Pertle Pledge often on t-shirts. And then if a student maybe made a poor decision, they may redirect the student and talk about the guideline for success and how they make it better exhibit that guideline. There are another couple of examples there, one from Bex and another one from Lakewood. You'll see lots of words like be responsible, doing your best, cooperation, showing respect throughout the different guidelines at each campus. Guidelines for success are also very applicable to secondary schools. You'll see the one for Belton High School, which talks about being respectful, being determined, being ethical, and they use the acronym PRIDE for theirs. And then also North Belton's is very unique. They talk about SR squared. It's being safe, being respectful, and being responsible. The other thing we're really focusing on this year um, are our common areas, making sure that there are very specific expectations in place for all of the common areas in each school, like the cafeteria, um, the playground, different um, common areas within the school, maybe the gym. And so it's important that these expectations are taught, they're retaught when needed, and they're posted. And, um, and you can see the picture, uh, oh, let me go back, you'll see the picture of the kids sitting in the, in the uh, that maybe the gym or the auditorium, and it's, you can tell there's hundreds of kids in there, and it's very important to have clear expectations. And those are developed by the school and the committee and reinforced and taught on an as-needed basis. There are a couple of other examples, one on hallway traffic rules and also on voice level expectations for different areas of the school. The third thing we're really focusing on um, is the classroom, making sure that each classroom has very specific expectations and that it's clear to students what is expected. And just like common areas, these are posted in each classroom and they're taught and retaught as necessary and referred to when students are being successful and also when they need redirection. And the acronym we use for our classroom expectations are CHAMPS. That's CHAMPS. You'll see what that acronym means there. It's basically what conversation level um, students are expected to have with a different activity, a specific activity, how they ask for help, what is the specific activity, are they allowed to move around the classroom, what does participation look like, and so forth. So it's very specific expectations, so students know, know what's expected of them. There's a specific example in one of our classrooms. Another thing we're really uh, going to work on this spring and later this fall 
is um, doing some staff development with our teachers on the variables they can manipulate in their own classrooms to help with student behavior. Um, just to briefly, how teachers structure the classroom, how they may change the structure to meet student needs, um, teaching expectation, asking themselves, are the, are the expectations clear? Do I need to reteach? Um, are my expectations too low? Are my expectations too high? Just really looking at the different variables within that classroom to see what they need to do or they could do maybe to help a particular kid because all kids may not need the same thing. In the three to one positive interactions, one thing we keep learning about is the importance of making sure that there are more positive interactions with students than negative interactions. So really purposely increasing those positive interactions with students, particularly those that may be struggling, and really working hard to increase those positive interactions. I'm also very excited to um, tell you that we are going to have a presenter from Safe and Civil Schools on October the 10th and the 11th, and she's going to specifically work um, with our teachers, well, it's really our administrators at this particular point, and um, members of the campus leadership team on interventions for students who are struggling with behavior so that um, the administrative team will have very specific strategies that they can take back and use in um, their intervention teams to recommend those particular interventions for students who are struggling. And now I'd like to turn it over to Emilio, Emilio to tell you a little bit about the, th the things that are going on at DAP where they've seen lots of success. I was able to go to the National Conference for Safe and Civil Schools back in 2015 and was able to bring back some great information that we're doing at our DAEP. Uh, we implemented the program back at the 15-16 school year, so this is our second year now to, to have this program. We've seen some great success, and mainly because we stress the relationships. We build relationships at DAEP. I've stressed that from day one with our teachers, and they understand that. We know research shows that students of low SES uh, have two negative interactions to one positive interaction. And Dr. Trejo just said that we want to change that to three positives to one negative. And we're doing that. We're doing that on a daily basis and we're making sure that our teachers do that. And because of that, our school and our culture has changed a lot of the AP. We've seen a lot of positive behaviors there. And one of the main things that we do is we give them a point sheet. And they get a point sheet every day, and the point sheet is based on the classroom rules, which we'll see in just a second. And every time this, the student does something right, the student does something positive, the teacher gives them points for that. So they get to add up, they add up these points, and then we'll talk about what we do with the points here shortly as well. So that gives the students motivation. That gives us a chance to support their behavior, and that also helps out in the classroom as well as far as classroom management. Now, just like all the other campuses, we have our expectations posted everywhere as well. From the time you walk into the building to basically the time you leave, we have expectations for arrival, expectations for the hallway, office, lunch, restroom, and dismissal. And if you just tour our classrooms, you'll also see our classroom rules, which are posted in every, in every room. All the classroom rules are the same. And the teachers did a phenomenal job of doing this. They took ownership of it. They got together. They said, these rules will work for us. We're going to make sure that we follow these rules. And uh, that empowers them to ensure that the program is successful. And if you see right there next to that, that's our staff rules. Our, our students always want to know, what well, you guys, we have rules. What about you guys? Well, the staff has rules, too. And they get to see that they, they also are accountable for, for their behaviors as well. All right, let's talk about the points that we said a few seconds ago. We have what we call a, st a student store, and uh, that is a strategy from Safe and Civil Schools. So the students can cash in their points for merchandise in the store. Uh, the students have told us what they wanted. We've stocked the store with things that they like. Uh, once a week, twice a week, sometimes if they've earned it, they've earned the right to go. They go to the store, they pick out what they want, a couple of items towards the end of the day, and then they go on their, go on their way. And that really has worked. The students have done a great job working towards uh, Getting things, toward, getting things in the store. And by the way, we do have expectations for the store as well. There's a little sign right there, that's the store expectations. So what does that mean for, what does that mean for the AEP? What have we seen? Well, because of our positive uh, relationships that we've had with our students, we've seen an increase of attendance. We've seen days this year where we've had 100% attendance. We've seen uh, the decrease in tardies, almost non-existent now. 
And we've also seen uh, the first four weeks of school, we've seen from last, four, from last year, from the first day of school to September 19th of this year, first day of school to September 19th, we've seen a decrease of about 50% on, on discipline referrals. So like I said, this is the second year we've done this. This is the second year that all the teachers have done the same staff we had last year, so they're, they're really into it. They, they, enjoy the, they enjoy the program. And we couldn't do this without them. It's the relationships that they built. That's what makes it successful. And also, at, you know, without the support that we have from administration, that's what helps us be successful. Uh, one thing I'd like to brag about, over the weekend, one of our uh, folks that's really involved with Safe and Civil is reading one of the new publications and they found a picture of some of the work that Miller Heights has done with Safe and Civil in um, their new publication, which is what's exciting to, to hear. Any questions? Listen, I just want to thank you for what you're doing with the DAP. That's, that's a uh, student population that we don't often hear a lot about um, and uh, um, don't get recognition for doing good things, certainly, and y'all are doing some great things with them and helping educate them. Those are those are our kids, and they're our kids that we want to be successful. So thank you for what you're doing. This is a, a, a great way of uh, tying in a, a program that's having some very tangible results, obviously. So, uh, and and while it's neat to see what's happening in elementary campuses, uh, to see that it's working at DAP says an awful lot about the, the program fundamentally. Uh, but the staff doing it. So thank you for bringing that. Thank you for, for that information. So anybody else have anything? Great. We appreciate it. All right. Well, let's close out a roof project. That's our next item. Our near last item. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, Yes, we're speaking about it. In the spring, we talked about uh, the high school roof under a Project A, Project B, and Project C. We uh, undertook Project A this year. We came in on time and under budget. Tonight, we'd like to present this to you to oh, have on. you accept the project so we can make final payment to the contractor and get to moving on with part Project B. Um, this is what the roof on top of uh, the high school looked like as we began, all that uh, really white material you see there are patches from different type, uh, different leaks and stuff that we had. You can see that there was quite a bit of patching going on. Our folks do a very good job at that, but it was time for this roof to be replaced. As you can see, it's around everything. It's around the mechanical, it's uh, across the roofs and everything, and uh, it took quite a bit of, uh, of uh, rubber to cover some of those holes, but uh, it was time for that to move on. This is what it looks like now after the contractor got finished. You can see that they've come in, they put a new membrane on, We've uh, upgraded everything to current um, <laughs> to current requirements. We've added uh, added a good bit of insulation, and uh, so we're more efficient. Uh, we have a 20-year warranty on our membrane, and so uh, we're pretty pretty happy with that. And this is just across another part of the roof uh, after uh, we got finished with the gas line suspended, everything painted up, and that's uh, what a roof looks like when a professional roofer uh, gets on top there and, and gets after it. So we're we're really uh, satisfied with that. And okay, so, the, so I was just saying, I want everybody to, to hear this. Wouldn't our logo look really good on that pretty roof? You know, with all the planes flying over. Or? Uh -huh. Well, in Project B, we'll okay. see if we have a place. I got told no. Told you got no. some no's? Okay, that's, uh, that's what I need. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you'll have to talk to her. She tells me what. I understand. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> the construction cost of this project, uh, as we spoke about in the spring, was $1,334,000. Okay. Uh, when we completed the roof and got finished, we ended up with uh, one deductive change order for an amount of $37,554 of items that we were able to save within the project, bringing the construction cost down from $1,334,000 to $1,296,558. And uh, uh, we have received all of the uh, closeout documents, uh, the warranties, lien waivers, consent to surety, final payment, and the final payment application. The certificate for payment and uh, for payment application number three, we have that in hand, and we're asking tonight that uh, you accept Project A uh, uh, and close out the Belton High School. Uh, actually, let me go back and say we recommend that you accept the close out of Belton High School Roofing Project A and release final payment of sixty-four thousand eight hundred twenty-seven dollars and ninety cents. If you have any other questions or anything, uh, I'm available to 
get here and talk about roofing. <laughs> when does B start? We will try to bring to you next month uh, uh, the beginning of Project B. And uh, we will plan Project B to begin the day after school closes in June and be completed prior to school opening in August of next year. We like on time and under budget. Well, we do, we do as well. And we like it when it looks like this when we get done. <laughs> very good contractor, absolutely. <laughs> no, but, is there a motion to approve? Mr. Cameron, Mr. Cameron, all in favor of the motion, raise your hand. That's unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, issues or concerns for future agenda or administrative reports? Yeah. Uh, like to, I'm uh, sorry, turn my mic on. CDC local review uh, that policy, uh, just ask the administration to look into that and explore options for how we might could uh, uh, amend that to uh, prevent the kind of things that we were dealing with today. Secondly, I'd, I'd like a follow up report on our uh, district um, network, Wi Fi uh, network. Uh, we uh, earlier approved the expenditure of uh, some significant money for equipment, uh, district, Belton High School, and then some uh, elementary campuses. Uh, but we've uh, heard some complaints and some grumblings from some of our high school kiddos, particularly, but around the district about access. Uh, I've experienced some access issues on Wi-Fi, and so would be curious where we stand with bandwidth, IPOs, and some kind of follow-up on that. That's a priority. Obviously, we spent a lot of time over the last several years investing in technology and expanding our uh, use of technology, and I, I'm, I don't want us to get behind that. And so I guess I just kind of want a status update, simple where we're at with that and in whatever format. Okay. Um, future agenda, future events. I uh, already mentioned Junior Scholar Ceremony tomorrow. Um, uh, Mike and Sue will be attending the, the uh, convention and delegate assembly uh, this weekend. Look forward to hearing uh, what you all learn there and, and uh, grieving not going to be there, but we'll represent Belton here. Uh, the Meet Belton for Military Families is next Monday, the 26th at Harris. would encourage everybody to come if you can. The Beef Red Carpet event, hopefully everybody's RSVP'd and had some opportunity to to get your reservations in for that is that's October 6th and then our next regular meeting is scheduled for October 17th. Um, and Randy before you end I want to share with you all about the policy summit that I attended oh, last weekend. That's, I was, well, <laughs> that's okay. That that's was it. it. I knew that, that was something. Something <laughs> else. So very quickly I know the hour is long spent but I attended a very interesting policy it was called a fall policy summit um, it was held at Paul Quinn College in Dallas. It was hosted by the African American Leadership Institute. And I will tell you, it was very interesting. They had several things, several tracks that were offered, uh, education, criminal justice, economic development, and then health and human service. Uh, I attended the education. Uh, there were topics such as higher education, college and career readiness, preparing and hiring and developing educators for gener generation tech and then AAA building a strong foundation in early literacy and as we were talking about different things today it's interesting because I just took some quick little notes and just bear with me here some of the things that I noted that they said and this was set up to where it was a panel of uh, different uh, elected officials and this is from all genres from everything from your state representatives to school board officials to superintendents so it was just a, a nice mixture but uh, those folks said things that we are saying here tonight that they said things like leaders as leaders we have to um, project what we expect uh, we should be empowering our teachers and challenging them to take risks uh, it's all about what's best for kids so even though this was hosted by the African-American Leadership Institute, 
all lives matter. That's the message that I got from them. And they talked about student testing, and they said, don't blame the kids. Articulate the vision. Discuss expectations. Outline what success looks like. Ask system questions like, are we delivering the right curriculum? This was an, an amazing uh, journey for me, and I appreciate being able to go up there and bringing that back to share. Thank you. Appreciate you sharing that with us. Would like to hear more about Absolutely. that maybe offline another time. Thank you. Um, at this time, unless we've missed something, it is 721 and the board will go into closed session to discuss personnel. Um, I do not expect us to take any action when we return. You're welcome to stay. We will come back to open session prior to adjourning. Uh, but if not, have a good evening. It, it is 759. We will reconvene an open session. There being no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Have a good evening.